I'm Barry Edelstein, Erna Fincy Viterbi, Artistic Director of the Old Globe in San Diego, California. And I'm so happy to be with all of you tonight. Thank you for joining us for Thinking Shakespeare Live. The Old Globe believes that theater matters and our commitment is to make it matter to more people. Well, the theater's magic power is to gather strangers together and bring them at an appointed time and place into an audience, a, a single community. With our three beautiful venues in Balboa Park temporarily closed, and I stress temporarily closed, we can't do that in person. So we are gathering in virtual forums like this in digital platforms and transforming our work from the physical world to the virtual world. And I cannot thank you enough for helping us simulate an act of theater this evening. Now, the Globe is one of the great Shakespeare theaters in the United States, and Shakespeare is absolutely central to our work. Our impulse to make theater matter means that we want to share with our audiences the way that we do this work and sort of throw the curtains open, invite people backstage with us to talk about the process. And that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to gather some actors and talk about Shakespeare's language and how it comes to life in the work of professional actors and professional directors on the American stage. And uh, we do this live a couple times a year at the Old Globe. It's always a great deal of fun. And uh, I'm looking forward to spending about an hour with you tonight, delving into the beauties and mysteries and wonders of William Shakespeare. Well, to do that, we have to turn back the clock about 400 years to the year 1623. An extremely important thing happened in that year, the publication of a book. And here it is, the first folio, the complete works of William Shakespeare published in 1623. You can see the title there, Mr. William Shakespeare's Comedies, Histories, and Tragedies. And at the bottom of the page, 1623, and that famous and very flattering woodcut of William Shakespeare. Well, this book did something that had never been done before. During Shakespeare's lifetime, he died in 1616, seven years before this book was published, about half of his plays had been published. But the other half of his plays, 18 of them, had not been published at the time of his death and would have disappeared if not for this book. Without the first folio, we would not know that all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players because the play As You Like It was published for the first time in the first folio. Without the first folio, we would not know that some are born great, some achieve greatness, and some have greatness thrust upon them, because the play Twelfth Night was published for the first time in the first folio. And without the first folio, we could have friends, we could go to Italy and see some Romans, we could come home and talk to our countrymen, but none of them would lend us their ears because Julius Caesar was published for the first time in the first folio. This volume brought together all 36 of Shakespeare's plays. It is the book that gave us Shakespeare. And it was brought together by two actors, two actors who are unsung heroes of world civilization. Their names were John Hemmings and Henry Condell, and they were members of Shakespeare's theater company and also among Shakespeare's friends. In Shakespeare's will, he left things to his family and to three strangers, the actor Richard Burbage, who was the first Hamlet and the first Romeo and the first King Lear and all the other great roles, and to John Hemmings and Henry Condell. They were his dear friends and he left them money in his will, 25 pounds to buy gold rings. Well, seven years after his death, Hemmings and Condell returned the favor by bundling Shakespeare's plays together into this volume called The First Folio. Why did they do that? Well, maybe they wanted to pay tribute to their friend's memory. They loved his work and they wanted it to reach a greater audience in, in the world. But also, you're not gonna believe this, but a pandemic is involved because the plague used to break out quite frequently in Shakespeare's London. And when it did that, the authorities would close down theaters. Can you imagine when, the, when, when a pandemic broke out, the authorities would close down theaters? Who ever heard of such a thing? Well, it happened then just like it's happening now. And so Shakespeare's company had to find ways to make money. They would go on tour, they would sell stuff, props and old costumes, and they would bundle up plays that had not been published and sell them to publishers. So whether for altruistic motives of love for their friend or whether for mercenary motives of trying to come up with some money for their theater company, they did what we're doing now, which is they pivoted to another form, another platform, which is publishing.
and we have Hemings and Condal to thank for bequeathing to posterity all the plays of Shakespeare. Now at the beginning of the first folio, they wrote a letter addressed to the great variety of readers. And there it is, it's one page of the folio. And in it, they talk about how sad it is that their friend Shakespeare is not alive to see this book be published. They talk about a little about his writing and how he wrote. And also they tip their hands to the fact that this really had a commercial motive because about halfway down the page, they say this. Uh, there it is right in the middle, but whatever you do, buy. So they wanted to sell copies of this book and they did quite a few. Now, later in this letter, they tell us a little bit about how Shakespeare wrote. And that's why I wanna talk about Hemings and Condal. You can see this little excerpt here. They say, his mind and hand went together and what he thought he uttered with that easiness that we have scarce received from him a blot in his papers. This is Shakespeare they're talking about, what he thought he uttered. That is a crucial phrase for all of us who work on Shakespeare's plays, what he thought he uttered. He had a thought in his head and then he uttered it. He spoke it just like I'm doing now. I have an idea in my brain that I'm trying to communicate and I speak it. It moves from my brain to the muscles of my mouth and out it comes. Thought followed by utterance. That's what thinking Shakespeare is all about. And that is what we're gonna talk about tonight. Well, to do that, I need some help. And so I am going to bring some friends here into cyberspace with me to help me bring Shakespeare's language to life this evening. And the first person I'm gonna bring out is, or bring on or bring forth, I don't know what the right preposition is, is my dear friend and the brilliant actor, Grantham Coleman. Grantham Coleman uh, will be familiar to Globe audiences from his amazing, dazzling performance as Hamlet in 2017. Since then, he's appeared on Broadway in The Great Society and in New York's Shakespeare in the Park as Benedict in Much Ado About Nothing, which you can stream at the PBS website and the Great Performances website at PBS. I recommend it. He's brilliant in a wonderful, wonderful production. His film and TV credits include Against All Enemies, NCIS Los Angeles, and The Americans, and he's a great graduate of the Juilliard School. Grantham, hi, thanks for coming. Hey, Barry, thanks for having me, man. This is amazing. How, how are things in LA, you good? They're well, they're well. Outside is still there, just with uh, less people. I understand. Well, listen, Grantham, I'm so happy for you being here. And I'm going to bring a friend out now, too, Megan Ketch. Megan last appeared at the Globe in Double Indemnity. She's been pretty busy since. On stage, she was nominated for an Ovation Award for Cry It Out in LA, and she's performed off-Broadway at the Manhattan Theater Club. She has extensive TV credits, including Tremors, opposite Kevin Bacon, American Gothic, Jane the Virgin, Gotham's, Blue Blood, The Good Wife, Glow, and many more. She's a big deal. She holds an MFA in acting from New York University, and she is an absolutely first-rate classical actor, Megan Ketch. Hi, Megan. Hi, Barry. Great to be here with you. I'm so happy that you're here. And you got your twinkly lights going in the background to a little festivity. I, it's a midsummer night's dream in my bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Well, I'm very, very happy that you're here. Thank you. Thank you and our me. third guest is one of the great actors in America, Richard Thomas. Richard is an icon in the history of American television and entertainment, uh, and he is a great friend of the Old Globe. He's appeared there a couple of times as President Jimmy Carter in a wonderful play called Camp David, and as Iago in my production of Shakespeare's Othello. He's an Emmy Award-winning and Tony Award-nominated actor who has appeared in over 100 films and television series, has appeared on and off Broadway and on stages across the country, and truly is one of the great Shakespeareans that the American theater can boast, Richard Thomas. Hi, Richard. Hi. How are you? Thank you for that. I'm, I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> Please stay. Hey, how are things in New York? Well, they're quiet. It's kind of like the day the earth stood still out there without Michael Rennie's silver jumpsuit. Uh, yeah, that's, let's hope those don't show up anytime soon. <laughs> Thanks for the invitation. I'm so happy to be here. I'm so glad that you're with us. The three of you, it's just an embarrassment of riches. I could not be happier than to have you here. Three just unbelievable American Shakespeareans. Okay, now we've turned back the clock to 1623. I've talked about thought and utterance. Now we're gonna jump into some text and we're gonna start with these two lines of Shakespeare. Richard, would you give us the first one, please? 
But look, the morn in russet mantle clad walks o'er the dew of yon high eastward hill. Excellent, thank you. And Megan, will you give us the second line, please? It is almost clear dawn. Excellent, thank you. But look, the morn in russet mantle clad walks o'er the dew of yon high eastward hill, and it is almost clear dawn. That's a lot of Shakespeare language. Let's figure out what the thought is that these two lines are trying to express. But look, the morn in russet mantle clad walks o'er the dew of yon high eastward hill. The morn, uh, the sun, in russet mantle, russet is kind of orange, mantle is a cloak. So the morning, wearing an orange cloak, is walking over the wet grass in that hill in the east, which is a fancy way of saying the sun is coming up. But look, the morn in russet mantle clad walks o'er the dew of yon high eastward hill. The sun is coming up. That's just an image, a metaphor of the sun walking over the hill in the east. Now, Megan's line, it is almost clear dawn. What does that mean? The sun is coming up. So both of these lines express the exact same thought. One is complicated and fancy and metaphoric and figurative, and the other is sort of plain and straightforward, right? I, when you wake up at five o'clock tomorrow morning, you could look outside and say it is almost clear dawn. Nothing Shakespearean about that. Okay, so why? Why do these thoughts express themselves this way? Shakespeare could write the sun is coming up any way that he wants. In the graduate seminar at university, we might ask, why is that first line so fancy? You could talk about anthropomorphism, the idea of comparing an inanimate object, the sun, to the form of a human, a man walking on the grass. But for an actor, that's not so helpful. An actor can't stand on stage and say, I'm going to give anthropomorphism now. An actor has to know why the character he's playing is speaking this way. Well, this is Horatio in Shakespeare's play Hamlet. Horatio is a graduate student in philosophy at Wittenberg University. We know that. He's Hamlet's best friend, the best friend of the prince. Before the play starts, a couple of soldiers have come to him and said, hey, Horatio, something amazing has happened. We were out on the roof of the castle last night, and we saw the ghost of the dead king walking around in armor. And Horatio says, you're crazy. And they say, come on. So that night, Horatio goes up to the roof of the castle, and wouldn't you know it, the ghost of the dead king comes walking around, and Horatio, the skeptic, is suddenly convinced, and he's terrified. And it's a freezing cold night in Denmark, and he's having the wits scared out of him by this ghost, and then suddenly he sees in the far eastern horizon a little glimmer of orange light. And he talks about the sun coming up in this very fancy way. And in that language, you can hear his relief that this terrible night is over. And you can hear him retreat to the poetry that he reveres and the language that he cherishes to express all of the emotional release and joy and sense of safety that this ghost has gone away. Richard, I want to bring you back and I want to ask you now to try that line. Tell me that the sun is coming up but use the fanciness of the language to express the emotional feeling that Horatio's having. Give it, give it a go. But look, the morn in russet mantle clad walks o'er the dew of yon high eastward hill. Fantastic. And you can hear this incredibly fancy idea express something that Horatio needs, puts a thought that he needs to express out into the world. All he's really saying is the sun is coming up, but he's doing it in this way that expresses his own inner need and his own inner emotional life. Now, Megan's line is completely different. That's from a play called Measure for Measure. And it's a really complicated story, but essentially what's going on is the Measure for Measure takes place in Vienna. There's a duke. The duke decides he wants to take a break from being the leader, and he leaves a guy in charge who's a bit of a tyrant. And the guy that the duke leaves in charge starts arresting people, mostly on morals charges, and he arrests a young man and sentences him to death by beheading on a morals charge. The duke, meanwhile, has disguised himself, and and he's wandering around trying to find out how this new guy is going to run things. And he comes across this case and he sees that this innocent young man is going to be beheaded for no good reason at all. So he comes up with a plan. 
he's going to find an actual bad guy murderer who's supposed to be beheaded that morning, slip him in for the innocent guy, and then take that guy's head and send it to the bad guy as proof that the other guy was executed. This crazy cockamamie head switcheroo beheading crazy substitution thing. And all this is going to happen at dawn. And so when he sees the sun coming up, he doesn't have time for a guy in a red cloak. He doesn't have time to talk about the dew. All he can do is get the idea straight out. Megan, will you try that? It is almost clear dawn. So great. You have two different kinds of language expressing the same thought. And this brings us to the central idea of how actors and directors work on Shakespeare in the theater. They ask this question, why am I using these words now? Given that what I'm trying to say is that the sun is coming up, why am I picking this way to do it? Why does Horatio talk about the sun coming up in that complicated way, but the Duke talk about the sun coming up in this simple way? Why doesn't Shakespeare write it in any of a hundred other ways? What we want to know is why am I using these words now? Why am I talking this way? Now here's another example also from Hamlet and Grantham. I'm going to ask you to try this one, please. We'll bring you in and there you are. The air bites shrewdly. It is very cold. The air bites shrewdly. It is very cold. That's one line of blank verse. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. One line of Shakespeare, it's two sentences. The first sentence is the air bites shrewdly. What does that mean? The air is biting shrewdly like a shrew. A shrew is a little rodent with a sharp nose that can get into little places. So Hamlet's saying the air is biting my skin like a rodent, which means it's cold. And then he says, it's cold. So this is one line of Shakespeare in which Hamlet says, it's cold, it's cold. Why does he do that? One half of the line is a metaphor about a shrew. The other half of the line, it is very cold. There's nothing Shakespearean about that. A couple days ago, we did our weekly pandemic shop at Costco, and we went into that room where they keep the lettuce. And I said, it is very cold. And my 12-year-old daughter said, Daddy, will you please stop quoting Shakespeare? But there's nothing Shakespearean about it. it is very cold. It's just straight language. The first half is different. So we asked, why? Why is Hamlet expressing himself the same thought two different ways? And I come to Grantham and I say, hey, Grantham, I've got an idea. Maybe the first half of the line is public and the second half of the line is private. Why don't you try that? The air bites shrewdly. It is very cold. Fantastic. Now flip it around. First half private, second half public. The air bites shrewdly. It is very cold. Fantastic. Now, I'm gonna bring Richard in and I got a third idea to run by you, Grantham. Let's say Richard is the soldier Marcellus. Unlike you and your friend Horatio, Marcellus hasn't been to Wittenberg University. Maybe Richard Marcellus doesn't really understand the kind of fancy way that the Prince of Denmark speaks. So when Hamlet says the air bites shrewdly, Marcellus doesn't know what he's talking about. And he has to look at him like, what do you mean? And then Hamlet uses the second half of the line to explain to this poor guy what it is he's trying to say. Fellows, why don't you try that? The air bites shrewdly. It is very cold. <laughs> Fantastic. So here's the point. Which one of those is right? Which one of those is wrong? Don't know, but here's what I know. We've asked, why is the language taking this form? Why am I using these words now? And that has given us three different ways to think about this line. Which one's right? Which one's wrong? There might be 500 different ideas that an actor and a director can cook up over a six-week rehearsal period, but they all come back to asking, why is he speaking this way? What does this character need to express that causes the language to be formed in that way. It's not Shakespeare talking, it's the character talking. The character is choosing words, just like I am now, to express his thoughts. Why am I using these words now? That's what we're gonna spend the rest of our session together looking at. And if the study is about these words, why am I using these words, then we need to look at those words carefully. And I'm going to propose four different categories in which Shakespeare organizes his words, and we're going to look at them in sequence. And the first is an idea called antithesis. Now, antithesis simply means opposition the contrast of opposite ideas. It's a fancy rhetorical term that just means opposites being 
become paired, okay? If I were to say to you, uh, for example, ask not what your country can do for you, you'd say, ask what you can do for your country. That's antithesis. Ask not, ask what you can do, what your country can do. That's antithesis. If I were to say to you, that's one, that's one small step for man, you would say, one giant leap for mankind. One small step, one giant leap. That's antithesis. That's all it is. If I were to say to you, oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light? You would say, what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming. Can you see what we hailed? That's antithesis. Can you see at dawn what we saw at twilight? That's antithesis. It's the idea that opposite ideas are being contrasted. When we sing the national anthem, we don't hit the, we, we, we hit proudly, we don't hit the antithesis, right? What so proudly we hailed, so it throws us off the trail a little bit. But, you know, I don't know, Francis Scott Key, you know, they couldn't find a guy who could really set the music properly, whatever. But in that idea is, I, is th this notion of antithesis, opposites being compared. I'm going to give you one more. If there's anybody out there in the garden state tonight, you will recognize this. If I said, in the day, we sweat it out on the streets of a runaway American dream, you would say, at night, we ride through mansions of glory in suicide machines. That's antithesis. In the day, we sweat. At night, we ride. Antithesis. So that's the whole, basically, the whole canon of Bruce Springsteen is summed up in that antithesis, right? In the day, we sweat. At night, we ride. There you go. That's all you need to know about Bruce Springsteen in one antithesis. Okay, now there's a, so much antithesis that we hear in American political life. Abraham Lincoln loved it, right? With, with charity toward all, with malice toward none. Uh, the world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it shall never forget what they did here. That's antithesis. Um, I have a dream that my four children will grow up in a country where they will be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. That's antithesis. We hear it in American political life all the time. And you know where else you hear antithesis? In Shakespeare. He was addicted to it. He's a dramatist. He's writing about conflict. And that conflict seeps right down into the very texture of his writing. Here are some examples, and Megan, I'm gonna ask you to kick us off. That which hath made them drunk hath made me bold. I wasted time, and now doth time waste me. Good. To be or not to be, that is the question. Now is the winter of our discontent, made glorious summer by the son of York. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves that we are underlings. In peace, there's nothing so becomes a man as modest stillness and humility. But when the blast of war blows in our ears, then imitate the action of the tiger. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is often tarred with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. Excellent. So you can hear all that antithesis. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is often turred with their bones. Shakespeare is addicted to antithesis. You can't go more than two lines in Shakespeare without finding antithesis. And an actor has to learn to lift those thoughts out and express them so that an audience can understand. Now, JFK said, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. And obviously you stress the words that are opposite each other. He, he, he did not say, ask not what your country, can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Doesn't make any kind of sense, right? Terrible, doesn't work. You have to stress the ideas that are opposite each other and then the sense emerges. So I'm gonna ask Richard to go through a wonderful speech in Shakespeare that really is kind of a laboratory of how he uses antithesis. Let me take a second to set it up. It's from a play called Henry VI, part three. Shakespeare wrote three plays about the reign of the English king, Henry VI. And it chronicles a civil war in England between two great families, the House of York and the House of Lancaster. 
The House of York was symbolized by a white rose on their coat of arms, the House of Lancaster by a red rose, and therefore that civil war came to be called the Wars of the Roses. So we have three plays in Shakespeare about the Wars of the Roses and how they work out. Now, Henry, the king, is a bookish sort. He'd rather hang out and pray and meditate and read than deal with state affairs. And so as the civil war heats up, he kind of can't deal with it. And his wife, Queen Margaret, says, Henry, you're messing up, scram. I'm going to take care of this. She raises an army and she sends him out of the court. And he goes for a walk around the countryside to see how his people are doing. He comes to a hill in the country. He calls it a mole hill. And in the valley below, there's a terrible battle taking place. And he sits down on this mole hill and he describes what he sees. And it's a wonderful illustration of Shakespeare's power with antithesis. Richard, would you take us once through? This battle fares like to the morning's war, when dying clouds contend with growing light. What time the shepherd blowing of his nails can neither call it perfect day nor night. Now sways it this way like a mighty sea, forced by the tide to combat with the wind. Now sways it that way like the self-same sea, forced to retire by fury of the wind. Sometime the flood prevails, and then the wind. Now one the better, then another best, both tugging to be victors, breast to breast, yet neither conqueror nor conquered. So is the equal poise of this fell war. Oh, that was beautiful, Richard. Thank you very much. And wow, what a mouthful that is. So what I'd like to do is take everybody through all the antithesis that's in this speech. And uh, you can see it there all highlighted in color. So this battle is contrasted against the morning's war. This battle, morning's war, dying, growing, clouds, light, they're opposites. Dying and growing are dictionary opposites, right? Sometimes Shakespeare just uses the, the definitions of the words to contrast them in opposites. Sometimes they're more abstract comparisons, clouds and light. So if I were to say, what's the opposite of light? You'd say dark, but here, Shakespeare is contrasting light with clouds in the context of the morning. What time the shepherd blowing of his nails, it's cold out, so he's going to warm up his hands. Can neither call it perfect day nor night. Now sways it this way, blah, blah, blah. Now sways it that way, this way, that way. Like a mighty sea, like the self same sea. The same sea is being used opposite itself, tide, Wind. Sometime the flood prevails and then the wind. Sometime then flood, wind. Now one the better, then another best. Each word in that line has an opposite. Now then one another, better best. Both tugging, yet neither winning. Breast to breast, same word being used antithetically, like hand to hand combat. Conqueror, conquered. So you hear this enormous amount of antithesis. Why is he talking this way? Because he's describing a battle. He's not going to use images of musical harmony to describe a battle. He's using images of combat, of opposition to describe a battle. He first says that this battle is like the morning, but that doesn't work because the, the sun wins every morning. The sun beats the clouds. That's why he goes on to the ocean, because it's a never-ending battle, and he says it's equal poise, like the, like the waves and the shore. Now, I want to point out one trap in this, because it's very tricky. If you look at that line, now one the better, then another best, if all you do is stress the words that are opposite, it's going to sound weird. It's going to sound like now one the better, then another best. And I call that the Shatner trap. Because you do that and you start to sound like Captain Kirk, right? I will not kill today. So we have to be careful of the Shatner trap. And by the way, I revere William Shatner. Everything I know about acting, I learned from watching Star Trek when I was a kid. And Shatner was a Shakespearean. He grew up in Canada. He was an actor at the Stratford Festival in Canada, famous Shakespeare theater. And that's where he started out. There's a story he tells, heard him tell it, that he was a, a young actor understudying in a production of Henry V, playing one of King Henry's brothers. And the guy playing Henry V got sick. And so they called up Shatner and they said, Shatner, you're on. And he said, I, I don't know the lines. So he got up on stage and he struggled his way through and he said, once more unto the breach, dear friends, once more or close the wall up with our English dead. And the crowd went wild. And the patented William Shatner acting style was born that day doing Shakespeare. And, you know, as I say, you know, Shakespeare's loss was the Federation's gain. But we want to watch out for the Shatner trap. 
We want to think our way through this. So it's not now one the better, but it's the idea, now one the better, then another best. Always render Shakespeare's language in terms of thought. Okay, so Richard, I want to ask you to try this one again, if you're up for it. And sure. this time, really let those antitheses lead you through. And you can't stress them enough. You want to you want to think your way through the speech by letting these oppositions help you form the thing that you're trying to describe as you look at this vicious battle in front of you. What do you think? This battle fares to like the morning's war when dying clouds contend with growing light. What time the shepherd blowing of his nails can neither call it perfect day nor night. Now sways it this way, like a mighty sea, forced by the tide to combat with the wind. Now sways it that way, like the self-same sea, forced to retire by fury of the wind. Sometime the flood prevails, and then the wind. Now one the better than another best, both tugging to be victors, breast to breast, yet neither conqueror nor conquered, so is the equal poise of this fell war. Wow, that was fantastic, Richard, right? And all that antithesis just leads you through. And what I hear is a man thinking through a problem and finding language to describe it. Just absolutely brilliantly done. So there you go, that's antithesis in Shakespeare. That's our first big area of language. And now we're gonna go on to the second big area of language in Shakespeare, and that is verbs. Shakespeare is a, a writer of plays. He's writing action. And in order to write action, you need verbs. And he writes incredibly vivid verbs and he makes up verbs out of other forms of language. And it has tremendous muscularity and tremendous power and tremendous drive. And so I'm gonna ask my wonderful friends here to read us through a bunch of examples of Shakespeare's incredible power with verbs. And Richard, I'm gonna ask you to start. To be or not to be, that is the question. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day. He hath disgraced me and hindered me half a million, laughed at my losses, mocked at my gains, scorned my nation, thwarted my bargains, cooled my friends, heated mine enemies, and what's his reason? I am a Jew. Why, man, he doth bestride the narrow world like a colossus, and we petty men walk under his huge legs and peep about to find ourselves dishonorable graves. But when the blast of war blows in our ears, then imitate the action of the tiger, stiffen the sinews, conjure up the blood, disguise fair nature with hard favored rage, then lend the eye a terrible aspect. Let it pry through the portage of the head like the brass cannon. Let the brow o'erwhelm it as fearfully as doth a gullet rock or hang and juddy his confounded base, swilled with the wild and wasteful ocean. Now set the teeth and stretch the nostril wide, hold hard the breath and bend up every spirit to his full height. Fantastic. On, on, you noblest English. Wow, that's amazing. You can hear the power, the force of all those verbs. In some ways, that special music of Shakespeare has a lot to do with the muscularity of his writing of verbs. And when I'm directing Shakespeare all the time, I will simply say to an actor, there's a verb there, there's a verb there, there's a verb there, without even having to say anything more about the character's life or about the situation. And suddenly the language roars to life. Years ago, when I was back in New York, the public theater produced a production of The Merchant of Venice with Al Pacino as Shylock. And I was this guy, my job was to somehow go to Al Pacino and say, uh, I'll tell you the words you maybe need to stress, absurd, right? Like I'm gonna tell that to Al Pacino. But there I was in a rehearsal room with him. He's working on that speech that we heard a little bit of. He hath disgraced me and hindered me half a million, laughed at my losses. And I said, um, 
Uh, Al, um, uh, if I may, uh, you know, the, the verbs, can you think maybe you might want to just stress the verbs? He said, okay, Barry, I'll give it a try. And he said, the earth disgraced me and hindered me. Half a million laughed at my losses, mocked my gains, heated my friends, cooled my, right? This amazing explosion of force, that kind of Pacino power harnessed to Shakespeare's amazing gift with verbs, and the thing came roaring to life. One of the great memories of my career in the theater was watching Pacino verb his way through the role of Shylock. It's a, it's a magical thing, Shakespeare's verbs. Now, we're gonna do a, a speech here that really is a laboratory for Shakespeare's use of the power of verbs. It's a little excerpt from Julius Caesar. Now, those of you who don't remember from high school uh, English class, Julius Caesar is a play about a great Roman general named uh, Julius Caesar, the eponymous hero of the play. He's coming back to Rome from an incredible conquest abroad, and he's so popular at home that people want him to take on political power and not just military power, and he becomes a little drunk with the idea of power and decides that, gee, maybe it would be good if I kind of ran this place myself almost like a king. Well, the problem is that Rome is a republic, and in a republic, Power is not supposed to rest with only one man. One guy is not supposed to have total authority in a republic. So a bunch of patriotic Republican senators get together and they say, we've got to do something about this guy who's trying to take over. And a guy named Cassius, who has a lean and hungry look, decides that he's going to get a bunch of guys together and they're going to stop Caesar cold in his tracks. The most important guy he needs is a man named Brutus, who is the son of one of the leading families of Rome. And so we have a scene where Cassius makes the case to Brutus about why Caesar should not be some kind of king in Rome. And it's a great example of Shakespeare's facility with verbs. So Richard, Grantham, I'm going to ask you to take us through this scene and then we'll talk about it. I love the name of honor more than I fear death. I know that virtue to be in you, Brutus, as well as I do know your outward favor. Well, honor is the subject of my story. I cannot tell what you and other men think of this life, but for my single self, I had as lief not be as live to be in awe of such a thing as I myself. I was born free as Caesar, so were you. We both have fed as well, and we can both endure the winter's cold as well as he. For once, upon a raw and gusty day, the troubled Tiber chafing with her shores, Caesar said to me, Darest thou, Cassius, now leap in with me into this angry flood and swim to yonder point? Upon the word, accoutred as I was, I plunged in and bade him follow. So indeed he did. The torrent roared and we did buffet it with lusty sinews, throwing it aside and stemming it with hearts of controversy. But ere we could arrive the point proposed, Caesar cried, help me Cassius or I sink. I, as Aeneas our great ancestor did from the flames of Troy upon his shoulder the old Anchises bear. So from the waves of Tiber did I the tired Caesar. And this man is now become a god. And Cassius is a wretched creature and must bend his body if Caesar carelessly but not on him. Fantastic. That was amazing, you guys, and so vivid, right? It's a crazy story. Cassius is walking down the street with uh, Caesar, and he says, hey, let's jump into the river Tiber and swim to the other side. And Caesar gets tired, and Cassius has to lift him out of the water. It's just nuts. And you can hear all these tremendous verbs there. You also hear some antithesis. This man has now become a god. So this is all cumulative. We, we, cumulative. we keep building on the ideas that we're learning. But let's pull the verbs out of this speech. I want to look at the swimming section there. Grantham. And here what I've done is I've just listed the verbs in the speech. So I'm going to ask you to take us through and use these verbs to try and tell the story that you just told, only the verbs, and see if we can hear the same story you just told us, but just with these. Troubled, chafing, said, darest, leap, swim, accoutred, was. Plunged, bad, did, roared, 
did Buffett throwing stemming arrive, proposed, cried, help sink, did bear, did tired. Amazing. It's kind of a miracle. I always find it amazing when I ask actors to do that because you can hear that the entire thought structure of the speech is resting all in the verbs. Now, I know some folks out there are saying, wait a minute, throwing, stemming, chafing, those are gerunds, those don't really count, troubled, accoutred, those are adjectives, right? And yes, that's true, those are participial adjectives, right? I've been looking forward to this all week, the day that I get to go on the internet and say the phrase participial adjectives. It's the gift of my life. But it's true. Any, any form of language that comes from a verb counts for our purposes. So even if it comes, even if it's used as an adjective, even if it's used as a noun, if it comes from a verb, we want it because it's got juice there. Okay, so Grantham, I'm going to ask you to do this one more time. Take us through just the section where they have a swimming contest, okay? And tell the story again to Brutus, but this time, let the verbs really lead you through. So as you think your way through the speech, let the verbs be the thing that gives it muscle and dispatch, okay? We'll give it another go. For once upon a raw and gusty day, the troubled Tiber chafing with her shores. Caesar said to me, darest thou Cassius now leap in with me into this angry flood and swim to yonder point. Upon the word, accoutred as I was, I plunged it in and bade him follow. So indeed he did. The torrent roared and we did buffet it with lusty sinews, throwing it aside and stemming it with hearts of controversy. But ere we could arrive, the point proposed, Caesar cried, help me, Cassius, or I sink. I, as Aeneas, our great ancestor, did from the flames of Troy upon his shoulder the old Anchises bear. So from the waves of Tiber did I, the tired Caesar. That is fantastic. You feel the excitement and the energy and the incredible vividness of that language. Grantham, it's wonderful. And right, we didn't have a five week rehearsal period. We just said, hey, let's look at the verbs. And you have the technical skill to be able to do that. And the language leaps off the page. So our first two lessons are simple. When you pick up a piece of Shakespeare you've never seen before, take a pencil and circle the words that are opposite each other, then take a yellow highlighter and hit the verbs. And the next thing you know, the passage will just absolutely leap off the stage. Two very, very big ideas in Shakespeare, antithesis and verbs. Okay, now we're gonna to go to the third big category of Shakespeare's language, which I call the height of the language. Now, we, we just heard Grantham talk about this passage from the end of the Cassius speech. I, as Aeneas, our great ancestor, did from the flames of Troy upon his shoulder, the old Anchises bear, right? Big, elevated, complicated language. And if you were to stop somebody on the street and say, hey, what does Shakespeare sound like to you? That's what they would say. They would go, eh, blah, blah, ye, thou, we, blah, 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 English accent, fancy words, lots of ED endings, right? Mm -hmm. Shakespeare would sound big and overblown. But here's the thing. Only some of Shakespeare is that. We call it heightened language. Much of Shakespeare, I would even say most of Shakespeare, is more simple, more straightforward. Language that sounds more like the everyday English that we speak, even if maybe it's with some grammatical forms that are 400 years old. And I want to ask uh, my friends now to take us through some examples of the different sounds of Shakespeare, not the big overblown Englishy, uh, fancy, collegey kind of things, but the simple utterances of Shakespeare. And Grantham, let me ask you to kick us off. Oh, she's warm. Oh, she's warm. That's from a play called The Winter's Tale. It's the climactic moment of The Winter's Tale. King Leontes believes he's responsible for the death of his wife. Someone makes a marble statue of his dead wife. He goes to touch it, expecting that the statue will be cold. But in a miracle, the statue comes to life. And his wife, who's been dead for 16 years, is alive again. He touches it and says, oh, she's warm. 
three little simple words. And this morning when I woke up, I cuddled in bed with my daughter and I said, oh, she's warm. And she said, dad, will you quit quoting Shakespeare? But the language is simple. The language is straightforward. There's nothing Shakespearean about, oh, she's warm. It's simple. It's quiet. It's calm. It's, 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 it's straightforward. Here's another example, Richard. Why should a dog, a horse, a rat have life, and thou no breath at all? That's from King Lear. Why should a dog, a horse, a rat have life, and thou no breath at all? Lear enters the stage with the dead body of his beloved daughter Cordelia, and he uses this very simple monosyllabic language. It's just one syllable in each word, right? And it's, it's made up of a dog and a horse and a rat. It's, it, it's the language of barnyard animals, and yet it is one of the most extraordinary expressions of grief ever written in the English language. Shakespeare can take the simple, the barnyard animal, the, the, the warmth of a human, and turn it into an extraordinarily expressive poetic idea. Okay, I'm gonna ask Megan to take us through yet one more example. There's a special providence in the fall of a sparrow. Beautiful, that's Hamlet. There's a special providence in the fall of a sparrow. There's evidence of uh, God, evidence of a higher power, even when a sparrow dies, right? Sparrow is a simple bird, an everyday bird, brown, little, there's a million of them, right? It's not, there's a special providence in the fall of a toucan. I mean, <laughs> I'm sure there might be a special providence when a toucan dies, but Shakespeare's point is that even when a sparrow dies, even when something common, even when something regular, even when something that's not terribly fancy dies, God is there. He can take a sparrow and find in it this kind of amazing poetic resonance. There's a, there's a New Testament reference in there to the sparrow as well. And he loads up this simple image with incredible complexity. That's the, that's the miracle of Shakespeare's language. One more, and Grantham, I'm gonna ask you to uh, give us a little reprise of your famous performance as Hamlet with this line from the play. There's a divinity that shapes our ends. We'll few them how we will. That's an amazing line. And wow, for all of us in the situation we're in now, it's so good to hear it. There's a divinity that shapes our ends, rough hew them how we will. There's a higher power that determines our fate, regardless of the mess we make of them. Now, there's a famous story about that line. There's a divinity that shapes our ends, rough hew them how we will. Famous 20th century Shakespeare scholar named John Dover Wilson. He was a don at Cambridge University, and he went for a walk in the country, which if you're a don at Cambridge University, you do a lot of, go for walks in the country. One day, he's walking in the country, and he comes across a crew putting a thatched roof on a house. And he stops and he watches these guy wor guys work for a while. And after a while, he goes up to the Thatcher and he says, uh, I won't say Margaret, he says to the Thatcher, hey, Mr. Thatcher, uh, what are you doing there? And the Thatcher says, well, uh, uh, I, I rough hew him. And then my friend there uh, shapes the ends, right? So he said, well, I, I cut them generally and just give them a rough chop. And then my friend takes a knife and he shapes that famous end that you see on a thatch roof cottage. And John Dover Wilson said, wait a minute, what? Uh, yeah, I, I rough you him and he shapes the ends. And, and, and he said, oh my God, that, that's Hamlet. There's a divinity that shapes our ends, rough hew them how we may. And this is Shakespeare making incredible poetry out of roofing. That's the miracle of Shakespeare. He takes the regular, the quotidian, the everyday, and he elevates it. Shakespeare's a poet who walked into Home Depot and walked out with Hamlet. And the miracle of Shakespeare's language is that, he can, is that he can take the simple and the plain and endow it with size. So yes, sometimes Shakespeare is fancy. What is this quintessence of dust? Sometimes Shakespeare talks about Aeneas and uh, Anchises and all these big famous references, but sometimes Shakespeare is simple. Oh, she's warm. And the actor's job is to ask why. Why am I being fancy now? Why am I being simple now? Why am I changing register? Why am I going from heightened language to simple language? And to illustrate this, we're gonna look at a scene from The Tempest. 
Now, The Tempest is a play from late in Shakespeare's life, tells a very simple story about a, a man named Prospero. He's the Duke of Milan, or Milan, as the verse would put it. We'll talk about why in a minute. And he's, he's a bookish sort of guy like Henry VI. He'd rather sit around and read and study than govern. And so his wicked brother, Antonio, takes advantage of the fact that Prospero is not paying much attention to the government, and he usurps the dukedom and throws his brother out, takes his brother puts him on a little boat with his infant daughter and sets him out to sea to die. A goodly courtier sends some of Prospero's books along and he and his infant daughter wash up on a deserted island where he studies his books and develops powers of the occult, in, including using the native people who are on this island to help him as agents of his magic. Well, one day he finds out that his enemies are sailing past the island. And so he uses his occult powers to, to create a storm, the tempest of the title, and shipwrecks his enemies on his island where he's gonna wreak revenge. Well, among the party is a handsome young prince named Ferdinand, and Prospero figures, I will A, get revenge on my enemies, and B, I will create a political alliance by having my daughter fall in love with this prince, and they'll get married. And so that's what the play is about. He gets revenge on his enemies, he gets his daughter married to this beautiful, handsome prince. And in the climax of the play, he puts on a wedding celebration for his daughter and her new husband. That's kind of a little 10 minute musical in the middle of the play, a pageant as it were. And right in the middle of it, he suddenly remembers this violent other plot that he's up to and he stops the performance cold. And we have this scene where he gives a wonderful speech about life and about death prompted by his daughter and son-in-law who are asking him why he's so upset. So I'm gonna ask all three of our actors to take us through. Well done. Avoid. No more. This is strange. Your father's in some passion that works him strongly. Never till this day saw I him touched with anger so distempered. You do look, my son, in a moved sort, as if you were dismayed. Be cheerful, sir. Our revels now are ended. These, our actors, as I foretold you, were all spirits and are melted into air, into thin air. And like the baseless fabric of this vision, the cloud-capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples, the great globe itself, yea, all which it inherit shall dissolve. And like this insubstantial pageant faded, leave not a rack behind. We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. Sir, I am vexed. Bear with my weakness. My brain is troubled. Oh, that's gorgeous. So did I cut you off? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. We, we wish your peace. Oh, I cut off the best line in the thing. We wish your peace. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, well, you know, next time, next time we'll get it clean. I'm so sorry, the three of you. Okay, so what we hear in that little passage is everything that uh, is, is, is special about Shakespeare's voice, the simple, the complex, the majestic. And Richard, I'm going to ask you to take us through again, and, and let's take a look for a moment at how that language changes register. The beginning of it is very straightforward. You do look, my son, in a movie sort as if you were just made be cheerful. Our show is over. It's very straight. There's nothing Shakespearean about that. These are actors, as I told you before, are spirits. And now something funny happens and are melted into air, and he repeats, into thin air. And then the language starts to increase in height. And like the baseless fabric of this vision, cloud-capped towers, gorgeous palaces, solemn temples, the great globe itself, and now we get the preacher's word, yea, all which it inherit shall dissolve. And like this insubstantial pageant faded, these big words, which is very different from, be cheerful, sir, right? Be cheerful, sir, is simple, straight. But now we're talking about an insubstantial pageant faded. The language has changed entirely. And now we go into that language like we were looking at a moment ago, simple monosyllables. We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. Dreams, sleep, it's one of the most famous lines in Shakespeare, and it's made out of everyday stuff. All of us sleep, all of us dream, but only Shakespeare can turn that into an incredible poetic vision of what it means to live 
and to die. And then the language crashes back down again. Sir, I'm vexed, bear with my witness, bear with my weakness, my brain is troubled, simple. So the speech goes from simple and prosaic and conversational to this increasing crescendo of complexity, to this very searing, beautiful statement about life and death made out of dreams and sleep, and then back down to earth again. And one way to work on this speech is to track those changes. So Richard, I'm just gonna ask you to take another go at it. We won't have the kids because they're mad at me for cutting off their cue. So this time it'll it'll just be it'll just be you, Richard. And um and, and let us really hear these changes of register in the language. You do look, my son, in a move at sort, as if you were dismayed. Be cheerful, sir. Our revels now are ended. These are actors, as I foretold you, were all spirits and are melted into air, into thin air. And like the baseless fabric of this vision, the cloud-capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples, the great globe itself, yea, all which it inherit shall dissolve. And like this insubstantial pageant faded, leave not a rack behind. We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. Sir, I'm vexed. Bear with my weakness. My brain is troubled. That's fantastic. I, I just feel better about life now, having heard you do that, Richard. It's so beautiful. And in the hands of an experienced, trained, technically gifted and adept actor, a simple observation like, hey, just take a look at how the language is changing, just opens up this amazing bounty of meaning and emotion and passion. So thank you, Richard, for that. Just absolutely beautiful. So that brings us to the fourth and final big idea about how Shakespeare organizes his language, which is one line at a time. So we've had antithesis, we've had verbs, and we've had the height of the language changing. Now we go one line at a time. And I'm going to jump right into this with a, a speech from a play called The Merchant of Venice, which I mentioned before. Now, uh, just to sum up, this is a complicated play, but I'll, but I'll give you the basic sketch of what's going on. The Merchant of Venice is largely about a young woman named Portia, beautiful young woman. Guess which of our three actors is going to play Portia? Mm -hmm. And she is charming and gorgeous and wealthy, and she's at that age that so many Shakespeare heroines are, which is the age that she wants to get married. But she lives in a culture where parents choose who young women are supposed to marry. And Portia has a problem because her father is dead. So there's nobody around to choose who she's supposed to marry. But her father, clever guy, set up a system that would organize who she was going to marry before he died, and he left it. And what it is is this crazy game. There's three boxes in Portia's house. One is made of silver, one is made of gold, and one is made of lead. Every man who wants to marry Portia has to go into this room where these three boxes are and pick one. And if he picks the one that's got a picture of Portia in it, he gets to marry her. But if he does not, then he has to forswear women for the rest of his life. So guys don't really want to play this game, and as a result, the poor dear can't get married. But there's one guy back in Venice, his name is Bassanio, the Lord Bassanio, handsome, aristocratic, playboy of a guy, exactly the right guy that should marry Portia, and she longs for him to show up. Well, Bassanio wants to marry her too, but he's broke and he can't make the trip to Portia's house to go woo her. So he goes to his friend Antonio, the merchant of Venice, and asks to borrow money. But Antonio is a shipping magnate, and all his money is out with his ships at sea, and he says to Bassanio, I'd love to lend you money so you could go visit this woman, but I'm broke. And Bassanio says, oh, isn't there anything you can do? And Antonio says, okay, okay, I'll borrow some money. So they go down to the Rialto where the moneylenders are, and they find this one Jewish moneylender named Shylock, and Antonio goes to him and asks for money. But Shylock says, wait a minute, you're an anti-Semite. Every time I see you, you, you spit on me, you kick me, you call me a dog, and now you want me to loan you money? And Antonio says, well, yeah, I need the money, so yes. And Shylock says, all right, I'll make a deal. I'll loan you the money that you need, but we're going to make a special contract that if you don't pay me back, I get to cut out a pound of your flesh. And Antonio, being a clear thinking and logical guy, says, deal. And so they shake hands on this crazy idea. 
that if Antonio can't pay the money back, Shylock gets to cut out a pound of his flesh. Okay, Antonio gives the money to Bassanio. Bassanio goes to Portia. He picks the correct box, which is the lead box, not the gold or the silver, and he wins the girl. And no sooner do they hold each other and kiss each other and celebrate the fact that they're going to get married than word comes from Venice that Antonio can't pay Shylock back. And Shylock is coming after him with his pound of flesh, to get his pound of flesh, coming after him with a knife. So Bassanio goes running back to Venice to try and save his friend. And Portia, who's just finally gotten the love of her life, says, I've got to do something to help. And she comes up with the only reasonable thing that a person would do in that situation. She dresses up like a boy and pretends to be a lawyer. So she runs off to Venice and she shows up in this courtroom where there's Shylock with a knife and scales to weigh the pound of flesh. There's Antonio with his shirt open. And oh my God, I'm, uh, there's my, my, my husband and he's fretting and he doesn't know what to do. And Portia disguised as a lawyer looks at the contract and says, well, yeah, the contract says you get to take a pound of flesh. But here's the thing, Mr. Shylock, you have to be merciful. If you're gonna cut the pound of flesh out, go ahead, but you have to do it with mercy. And Shylock objects. And he says, why do I have to be merciful? On what compulsion must I? Tell me that. And Portia answers with a very famous speech. Whew. And now, Megan, I'm going to ask you to take us through that very famous speech that you tell Shylock in response to his query about mercy. Off you go. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives and him that takes. Tis mightiest in the mightiest. It becomes the throned monarch better than his crown. His scepter shows the force of temporal power, the attribute to awe and majesty wherein doth sit the dread and fear of kings. But mercy is above this sceptered sway. It is enthroned in the hearts of kings. It is an attribute to God himself and earthly power doth then show likes gods when mercy seasons justice. Excellent, beautiful, Megan. It's a great speech and you've done it beautifully, but I've played a little bit of a trick here because that big chunk of text is not how Shakespeare actually wrote this speech. There you see a big piece of prose like out of a novel, but in fact, Shakespeare didn't write it as a big piece of prose. He wrote it as verse. Looks like this, about 15 lines of verse. And now we come to this thought about doing the language one line at a time. But before we can do that, we need to understand something about Shakespeare's verse. And that brings us back again to high school English and this phrase, iambic pentameter, iambic pentameter. That's the poetic meter, the, 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 the musical signature, the time signature of Shakespeare's verse writing. What does it mean? Well, simple. And I am is two syllables. And the first syllable is unstressed and the second is stressed. So an I am is a unit of two syllables that goes didum. New York, Detroit. First syllable unstressed, second syllable stressed. It goes didum. Penta means five, like the Pentagon has five sides. So five counts of iams goes de dum de dum de dum de dum de dum. That's iambic pentameter. De dum de dum de dum de dum de dum. And that is the backbone of 90% of Shakespeare's verse writing. Pick any famous line of Shakespeare, you're going to hear iambic pentameter. And I'm going to ask my friends to take us through some, starting with you, Grantham. A horse, a horse, my king, dum four, a horse. To be or not to be, that is the question. Once more, unto the breach, dear friends, once more, or close the wall up with our English dead. Oh, Romeo, Romeo, where for art thou Romeo? <laughs> friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. Good night, good night, parting is such sweet sorrow. Okay, there's, there's, there's William Shatner getting his revenge, right, <laughs> for me making fun of him by doing it. Now, of course, no one who speaks English would do it that way. We're lampooning the fact that Shakespeare's language is written by de dump de dump de dump de dump de dump So here you can take a look at what iambic pentameter says about Portia's famous line, the quality of mercy is not strained. But nobody who speaks English would say it that way. What we would do is we would say the quality of mercy is not 
strained. So the stresses move around in the line a bit. I'm sitting here in San Diego. There's a famous Californian who once observed that we should trust but verify, and that's how it works with iambic pentameter. We want to we want to trust our instincts as a speaker of English that we're going to say Shakespeare in the right and sensible way, but we want to verify it by comparing it to what iambic pentameter says. So if you visit a rehearsal room where there are Shakespearean actors working, you'll see people going flapping out what the iambic pentameter says to see if it can give a hint, make a word special, tell us a special stress in a word, but then they speak English just like everybody else and they will find the natural way to express it. So trust, but verify, trust your instincts, but compare it to the iambic pentameter. But we still have to ask, well, why? Shakespeare's writing in iambic pentameter. Why am I using these words now? Why did he do that? Well, the thing about iambic pentameter is that it makes every line 10 beats long and gives you an opportunity at the end of the 10th beat to think up what's going to come next. Here's where thinking Shakespeare comes in. The language goes one line at a time. We think the next line and then we say it. Count to 10, think, count to 10, think. That's how Shakespeare writes. He knows he's writing iambic pentameter and he's doing it to create spontaneous thought in the minds of his characters. So if I were to say, once more unto the breach, dear friends, once more, or close the wall up with our English dead. In peace there's nothing so becomes a man as modest stillness and humility. But when the blast of war blows in our ears, then imitate the action of the tiger. And all I'm doing is snapping my finger at the end of every line, which gives me an opportunity to think up what, what comes next, okay? Now, Megan, I'm going to ask you to play a little game here with me that really illustrates how this works. I'm going to show you each line of this speech, and at the end of each line, I'm going to ask you a question, and you're going to answer that question with the next line of text, and this is going to force you to think up the next line at the end of the previous line, okay? So you're going to say a line, I'm going to ask a question, you're going to answer me with the next line. What do you think? Great. Here we go. Go ahead. The quality of mercy is not strained. What is it? It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven. Where? Upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. What do you mean? It blesseth him that gives and him that takes. What? Tis mightiest in the mightiest. It becomes... What? The throned monarch better than his crown. What is this? His scepter shows the force of temporal power. What about it? The attribute to awe and majesty. So what? Wherein doth sit the dread and fear of kings. What else? But mercy is above this sceptered sway. What do you mean? It is enthroned in the hearts of kings. Anything else? It is an attribute to God himself. So what? And earthly power doth then show likest gods. When? when mercy seasons justice. Fantastic, right? So what we're doing is we're forcing the actor to think the language one line at a time. If you pick up a piece of Shakespeare you've never seen before, cover it up with a piece of paper and say it one line, then slide your paper down, say the next line, slide your paper down, say the next line. And you will find that the language automatically comes to life because that's how Shakespeare laid out the character's thoughts. Now, believe me, I spend a lot of time in rehearsal rooms with actors. They love it when I shout out, what, at the end of a line. No actor is happier than when the director is going, what, to their face, right? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna spare you that particular indignity, Megan. And this time, I'm gonna ask you to go through the speech one more time, but without me shouting at you, you see if you can find the next idea at the end of each line so that you're thinking your way through the language one line of verse at a time, okay? Off you go. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that takes and him that gives. Tis mightiest in the mightiest. It becomes the throned monarch better than his crown. His scepter shows the force of temporal power, the attribute to awe and majesty, wherein doth sit the dread and fear of kings. 
but mercy is above this sceptered sway. It is enthroned in the hearts of kings. It is an attribute to God himself, and earthly power doth then show like gods when mercy seasons justice. That's fantastic, Megan. Beautiful work, right? And it's actually easier and clearer because all you have to do is breathe and count to 10, right? That's the secret to playing Shakespeare. Breathe and count to 10, and the language will unfold itself in a beautiful way. What a great speech. Shylock doesn't particularly buy it, but you know, it's it's a great effort by Portia nonetheless, and you did it wonderfully. So, okay, there are our four big ideas about how Shakespeare organizes his language. Antithesis, verbs, the changing height of the language, and phrasing one line at a time. You've just gotten a Juilliard education in one short hour on the internet. So there you go. That's how Shakespeare's language works. And it's all about why am I using these words now? Now you're gonna get a chance, we're gonna review everything, and then I'm gonna give you a chance to try some Shakespeare at home where you're safe and sound. This upcoming now is a speech from Othello. Richard played this part at the Globe, it's, it's Iago speaking. The wonderful thing about Shakespeare is that even though Iago's a terrible bad guy, he says some beautiful stuff and we can lift it out of context and sort of forget that he's a bad guy for a while and listen to the beautiful things that he has to say. So he gives a wonderful speech about reputation. At one point, he's in the middle of a complicated manipulation of Othello, and Othello demands to know what's on his mind. And he says, sorry, I'm not going to tell you what's on my mind because it's, it's, it's my private thoughts, and my reputation is mine. You might accuse me of thinking something improper, and nothing's more valuable to me than my good name. And he does this wonderful, beautiful speech about the value of our good name. Richard, will you take us through it, please? Good name in man and woman, dear my lord, is the immediate jewel of their souls. Who steals my purse, steals trash, tis something nothing. Twas mine, tis his, and has been slave to thousands. But he that filters from me my good name, robs me of that which not enriches him, and makes me poor indeed. Fantastic, Richard. Thank you. Now, in that short speech of Shakespeare, you see everything that we've been talking about. So take a look. There's antithesis. Man, woman. Purse, trash. Something, nothing. Twas mine, tis his. Not in riches, makes me poor. So there you see antithesis laced throughout this speech. You see great verbs in this speech. Is, steals, twas, tis, and a great verb, filches, robs, enriches. So vivid verbs in this short little speech of Shakespeare. You see changes of height, right? Mostly Iago is a pretty unpoetic guy in Shakespeare. He speaks very straightforward, simple language throughout the play, but he's capable of metaphor when he needs it. Good name and man and woman, dear my lord, is the immediate jewel of their souls. And he lays out this incredible poetic image about what a good name is. And also phrasing one line at a time. He that filches from me my good name, what? Robs me of that which not enriches him, what else? And makes me poor indeed. So all the big ideas that we've been looking at this evening are present in every little corner of Shakespeare, including in this little seven line speech. So now folks at home, it's your turn. Richard's gonna take you through this language one line at a time. You're gonna say it with him using all the stuff that you've learned today. Megan and Grantham and I are gonna watch and Richard's gonna guide you all through. So ready, whenever you're ready, Richard, and all you folks at home, regale us with some wonderful Shakespeare. Here you go. Okay, let's go. Good name in man and woman, dear my Lord, is the immediate jewel of their souls. Who steals my purse, steals trash, tis something, nothing. But was mine, tis his, and has been slave to thousands. But he, that filches from me my good name, robs me of that which not enriches him, but makes me poor indeed. 
Fantastic, everybody. And I could hear it all over San Diego. Richard, I bet you heard it in your building. Grantham and Megan, I bet you heard the streets of Los Angeles alive with the voice of Shakespeare. And so that's what we're here to talk about tonight. This is how Shakespeare's language works. This is what happens in the rehearsal room of a great theater like the Globe as we look at how to think our way through Shakespeare. So all you folks out there, I wanna ask you a big favor. If you would, go to the Globe's website and you'll find a page called Globe Rising. If you enjoyed tonight's program, maybe consider a little contribution to the Globe and its work and help us keep this great theater company and most important, its people intact until that very, very happy day when we can reopen. While you're on our website, check out all our online offerings. We have incredible stuff going on, new plays that we've commissioned, our arts engagement work, programs much like this. It's a, it's a bounty of material as this great theater has shifted its content online. And so once again, please, if you enjoyed tonight, please consider a contribution. So uh, look, uh, uh, because you know, if I can just bring it back to Hemings and Condal for a minute, if you'll remember, take a look. Whatever you do, donate. Okay. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. Now, look, I want to, I want to wrap up by uh, seeking a benediction from my three incredibly wonderful friends. I've asked each of them to propose a Shakespeare line that can uh, give us a little bit of balm and a little bit of contentment in our current situation. Megan. Wise men there sit and wail their loss, but cheerly seek how to redress their harms. That's a good one from Queen Margaret in Henry VI, right? Don't sit around being sad, but happily look for a way to fix stuff. We're all gonna need that when the world reopens. We can't sit around thinking about how sad we've been. We have to figure out how we're gonna redress our harms. Grantham, how about you? The worst is not, so long as we can say this is the worst. Right, so listen, I know things may be bad, but we're alive. So as long as we're still talking, it's not really as bad as it could be. As long as we're on the north side of the grass, things are actually kind of okay. The worst is not, so long as we can say, this is the worst. And Richard, one more, please. There is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. And that's Hamlet telling us that really, if you think things, that's how they're gonna be. So really, is this a bad situation? Is this a good situation? It all depends on the perspective that we bring to it. There's nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. With that, my three dear friends, I wanna thank you for your beautiful work. Megan, Grantham, Richard, what gifted, wonderful artists you are. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your glorious, beautiful work this evening. Thanks for joining us. I wanna thank you also to the people who worked so hard at the Globe to make this possible. Justin Waldman, our Associate Artistic Director who produced this. Leela Knox, our Production Stage Manager, who's turned this into a television show worthy of the National Broadcasting Company. Kevin Antonil, the master technologist who has figured out how to take all this, these feeds from all over the country and stitch them together and make something beautiful to put out on the internet. Chandra Antonil, who's helped out in countless ways. Our sound director, Paul Peterson, for helping us out. Jason Bieber, our lighting, direction, thank, lighting director, thank you. Chanel Cook, our graphics designer, who had so much to do with making our slides look so nice tonight. To all those people and to everybody at the Old Globe, my thanks. And I'm gonna give the last word tonight to the two actors who started us off Hemings and Condal, who put together the first folio. Remember John Hemings and Henry Condal, their famous letter to the great variety of readers? Well, here's how it ends, and it really sums up a great way for us to think about Shakespeare. But it is not our province who only gather his works and give them to you to praise him. It is yours that read him. And there we hope, to your diverse capacities, you will find enough both to draw and hold you. For his wit can no more lie hid than it could be lost. Read him, therefore, and again, and again. And if then you do not like him, surely you are in some manifest danger not to understand him. Read him, therefore, and again, and again and then go see his plays at your local theater, like the Globe or wherever it is that you love to see theater performed. 
Till we see you again, don't panic, be brave, be kind, take care of yourselves, take care of each other. Thank you so very much. Good night.